The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... said Mr. Henry David Thoreau, is the stream in which I go fishing. That's very well put. However, when one goes fishing, one can never tell just exactly what one may catch. When one fishes in an ordinary river, one may throw back what one doesn't like. But where may one throw an unwanted catch from the river of time? Darling, I'm home. Is supper ready? Uh, Supper? I'm in a hurry. I have to go to the meeting. The meeting? Luther, haven't you just come from the meeting? I've come home for supper. But you've had supper. When? Before you went to the meeting. But I haven't gone to the meeting yet. Oh, how can you say that? Professor Tomlinson just called and said you made a brilliant speech. What time is it? Ten o'clock. It can't be. It's only six. No. Agnes, what... What happened to the last four hours? mystery drama, Pie in the Sky, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Bob Caliban and Terry Keene. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It might have been. Yes, as the poet said, these are the saddest words of tongue and pen. How many of us can say, it might have been? Of a road not taken. Of a door not opened. Of a question never asked. An answer never given. All of the missed opportunities. Would we really have been better off in the long run? Our story takes place not too long ago. And the mind of an elderly gentleman named Luther Temple is musing over the very questions we have just posed. I don't know. I could have been a millionaire. A billionaire. A trillionaire. Luther. What is it? Are you talking to yourself again? Who? Me? Well, I'd like to know who else might be sitting in the room. I never talk to myself. Yes, dear. Why don't you go inside and... Oh, fix us a cup of tea. You just had a cup of tea. Well, then let's have a cup of coffee. Coffee? Why? Agnes, look out the window. Tell me, what do you see? Oh, my goodness, Luther. It's a rainbow. Well, then we have to have a slice of pie, too. You'll spoil your appetite for dinner. Can't be helped. We have to do it. Why do we have to do it? Because that's what it says to do in the song. What song? The one everybody's singing on the radio these days. Just around the corner, there's a rainbow in the sky. (laughs) So let's have another cup of coffee. And let's have another piece of pie. Oh, Luther. (laughs) What am I going to do with you? Well, if after more than 50 years of being married, you don't know, what's the point in asking? Pie and coffee. All right. A good woman. But if I had become a millionaire, a billionaire, would I have stayed married to her? Most of the folks who become very successful, well, what's the point? Now, you may be asking, what's this millionaire, billionaire, trillionaire talk? Well, listen, you'll see. I think it began one day back in 1907. Yes, yes, 1907. Agnes? Agnes? Will you come in here, please? Uh, yes, Luther, dear. What is it? That noise. That abominable noise. Where's it coming from? The parlor. 
What's it supposed to be? Darling, I bought it this morning. It's a phonograph. It plays music. That screeching, wailing, caterwauling? That's music? Of course, darling. Can't you follow it? It's really a lovely tune. Oh, please lower it. Oh, I'll shut it off. No, no, no. Leave it on. No, it bothers you. I'll just have to put up with it, I suppose. Martha's cleaning in the parlor. Martha, please stop the machine. There, now. Better? Much better. Uh, darling, I want to talk to you about money. Yes? The money my Aunt Minerva left me. Well, it's your money, dear. No, darling, it's our money. Now, what should we do with it? Do you have to ask? Put it in the bank. The bank? Do you realize that the bank pays you as much as two and one-half percent interest? That much? Do you realize that at that generous rate, you will actually double your money in precisely 40 years? No, I hadn't looked at it that way exactly. Well, what did you have in mind? Oh, the stock market. The stock market? Now, please, Luther, it uh, was just a thought, just an idle, fleeting, vagrant thought. Well, darling, as I say, it's your money. Oh, we'll... Put it in the bank. Now, let's forget about it. Um, Agnes, where, where's my pipe? Are you going to smoke your pipe? Well, I've become kind of used to it. Oh. I admit I started it because I hoped it would make me look older. Well, after all, I do seem young to be a professor of mathematics, but I find I rather enjoy it. However, if it bothers you... No, uh, please, go ahead. Light up. Oh, uh, where is my pouch... Your pouch? Yes, a special pouch I bought in which I keep my tobacco. It's dark brown. Well, I'm sure I haven't seen it. Could you have left it somewhere? Could I? Well, let me see. Of course. Oh, I remember now. I was at the faculty club. I, I'd better go get it. You'll walk all the way over to the faculty club just to get some tobacco? Oh, I need the exercise. But look outside. It's pouring rain. Well, I'm certainly not going to melt. <laughs> So, I remember I walked over to the faculty club, and the steward had my pouch. Of course, he gave it to me. As I was about to leave, Professor Tonneau came in. I tried to avoid him, but too late, he saw me first. My dear Temple, how are you this perfectly miserable day? Uh... Quite well, Professor, but if you'll excuse me, I, I have a most pressing engagement. But I cannot excuse you. Oh, you look chilled, drawn, peaked. Come, for the sake of your health, you must have a hot punch. Steward, uh, but Professor... two club specials for Professor Temple and me. Now, sit, Professor. Sit. Uh, my wife is expecting... Congratulations. We must drink to the new arrival. No, 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 no. Uh, she's not expecting a baby. She's expecting me. Uh, won't she be happier to know that you are sitting in the club, cozy and warm, rather than battling the cruel elements outside? Well, how could she know that? Rest assured, my friend. She knows. She knows. <laughs> Talking about your wife, I understand that she has come into an inheritance... You do? Yes, and may I offer a word of good counsel? I really must be going, nonsense, Professor. Nonsense, nonsense. Ah, ah, the hot punches. The steward set them down. Thank you. A toast. I give you this newly born, freshly minted 20th century. <laughs> a time of unbelievable upheaval, as well as fantastic opportunity. What do you think, my friend? Upheaval? Things seem to be settling down nicely all over the world. Well, uh, thank you for the drink. Uh, but now, I, you, you haven't finished it. I really shouldn't, you know. Talking about your wife's inheritance, do you have any plans in that direction? Yes, we have agreed to do the prudent thing. Yes, I know, and place it in the bank. But is that prudent? Well, how can you deny it, Professor? One must move with the century. Where? Wherever it leads us. Assuming that's true... Where is it leading us? Look about you. In the street. What do you see? 
Every day, more and more of those horseless carriages. Contraptions of the devil. Why do you say that? Well, who but the devil could devise machines that emit such foul-smelling fumes? They will require, I admit, some getting used to. Oh, if the Almighty had intended for us to drive about in machines, would he have created so many millions of horses? Plans for this world, from whatever source, are constantly being revised. I intend to place my money in horseless carriages. Horseless carriages. There's a company being organized to produce these things which deserves some attention. If you don't it's mind. Called General Engine. I really must be going. What's that? A burst of thunder, a streak of lightning, what else? Now, as I was saying, but I this company you. will manufacture these horseless carriages. And actually, the name will gradually disappear from our language. You will call them automobiles. I will call them instruments of the devil. The company is being organized now. It requires financing. From the gullible, of course. The stock is selling for mere pennies a share. And it isn't worth the paper it's printed According on. According to present projections, the stock will be worth a fortune by 1928. Projections made by whom? By people who have foresight. Now, it is estimated that an investment of $1,000 today will be worth well over $7 million in less than three decades. Professor, I have been detained long enough. I simply must be getting home. Soak to the skin. Oh, get those wet things off and I'll make you something hot to drink. I've already had something hot to drink. Yes, I smell it on your breath. Oh, Luther Temple, have you been indulging in spirituous liquors? How did that happen? I don't know how it happened. I ran into this fellow, Tano. Professor Tano. And who is he? He's new. What does he teach? Oh, let me think. Uh, uh, physics. No, no. That's, and that's not quite it. Uh, oh, yes. Metaphysics. What's that? Oh, that's new, too. Well, what's it about? I don't know. It has something to do with the mind, I suppose. Wait a minute. Did... Did you tell him about your inheritance? Why would I tell him? How would I tell him? I don't even know him. But he knew about it. How could he know about my inheritance? We only received the letter from her lawyer this morning. Did... Did you mention it to anyone at all? Of course not. Did you? Well, I hadn't been out of the house all day until I went to the club just before. Well, you must have said something about it to this professor... What's his name? To know. But I know I didn't. You might not have been aware of it. How could I have not been aware of it? Well, there's no other explanation. How else would he know about it? But... Uh, dear, look, well, why don't we forget it? We'll only become bothered and overwrought and it'll all be for nothing. Oh, I suppose you're right. But, um, talking about the inheritance, I received a telephone call from my brother George. Oh, George. Do you know what he said he's going to do with his share? Something foolhardy, no but doubt. George is really very sensible sometimes. Now, he's going to take his thousand dollars and invest it in the stock market. Which means he is prepared to kiss it goodbye. This friend of his has some inside information. There's always inside information. This is a stock that must go up. It must? According to what law? According to the imperative of the coming century. Which is? This is to become the era of the horseless carriage. Oh, no. No, no, please, no. The stock is called General Engines. It's estimated that in less than three decades... An investment of $1,000 will be worth over $7 million. What did you say? That's what my brother told me. No doubt, but who told him? Certain information is being bandied about. Well, tips on the market can certainly circulate over a wide range. But other information... How, for example, did Professor Tonneau know about Agnes's inheritance? More to the point, who is Professor Tonneau? We may find out in Act Two.
Is it all a matter of fate? Are there people who are born to become rich and other people who are destined to remain poor? For some people, is opportunity a vision and for others, is it merely an illusion? Ah, well. Happy is that man or woman who, knowing his or her fate, accepts it and makes the best of it. Sometimes. Yes, like the song says, just around the corner there's a rainbow in the sky. So let's have another cup of coffee and let's have another piece of pie. Now, what are you muttering about, Luther? Who, me? Nothing. Nothing at all. Mm. Oh, that coffee smells good. <laughs> so does the pie. Well, it's baked fresh. You know, I estimate, in the course of our married life, 47 years, you serve me a cup of coffee and a piece of pie at least once a day. <laughs> that would make it, let's see, 365 times. Five times seven. Okay, three... 17,155 times. I always did have a head for figures. Oh, I had an eye for them, too. Yours was the prettiest in town. Yeah. Now, the pie isn't the only thing that's fresh in this house. Agnes, do you remember your Aunt Millicent's inheritance? Aunt Millicent's inheritance? Yeah, she left you a thousand dollars. Did she? Back in 1907, yes. Oh, that was such a long time ago. She remembers. She remembers very well. She also remembers what she wanted to do with it. And what I said we shouldn't do with it. She listened to me. Yeah, she always did. She still does. And she never says, I told you so. Well, hardly ever. Oh, I remember that night, long ago, in 1907. I'd come back from the faculty club where I'd forgotten my tobacco pouch. Was that when it all began? More pie, Luther? Uh, no, thanks. Mm. No, this is fine. Well, I think I'll light my pipe and smoke for a while, if if you, you don't mind. It's your house, too, Luther. Hmm. Mm. What is it? It's funny taste to this tobacco. Well, I should imagine all tobacco would taste funny. It doesn't taste bad. Just strange. Yeah, different. Different than what? Mm, from the kind I usually buy. Well, that's your pouch, isn't it? Yeah, sure. It even has my initials on it. L.T. Well, I'll go inside and see to the dishes. Well, I know the smoke bothers you. I'll, I'll put it out. You'll do no such thing. A man's home is his castle. Isn't that a wife for you? Well, anyhow, later that night we were in bed, asleep, when suddenly, was I dreaming? Or was it real? It seemed the whole house began to shake. I felt as if the bed was spinning round and round. Luther. We, we'd better get out of here. Luther. Hey, it's an earthquake. Luther, what is it? Don't just lie there, woman. This is the end of the world. Luther, wake up. Wake up. What are you talking about? I am up. Luther, you're having a bad dream. It's no dream. The walls are closing in. Luther, please, wake up. Luther, where are you going? I, I want to look around. See if there's been any damage. What are you talking about, damage? Well, didn't you feel it? No, Luther. It was nothing. Nothing? I thought the place would fall apart. Are you sure you weren't uh, just dreaming? Agnes, I was wide awake. I tell you, it was no dream. Yes, dear, I I if you say so. It was the strangest, craziest... But it was real. All right, it was real for you. Oh, I'll say it was. Well, it's only three in the morning, so go back to sleep. Oh, I can't. I'll tell you what let's do. I know. Let's have another cup of coffee. And let's have another piece of pie. I don't know. I really don't. But things 
started to happen. What kind of things? Well, it mostly had to do with... I suppose you could say it was time. Like, well, next day I said to Agnes... Uh, remind me to stop off at Belcher's Pharmacy this afternoon. Oh, what for? Well, I have to get this prescription filled. What prescription? The one Doc Simmons wrote out. When? This morning. Did you go to Dr. Simmons this morning? No, you did. I did? You said you had this headache and it just wouldn't go away. I didn't have a headache this morning. Now, Agnes, I called off my morning classes and I took you to Dr. Simmons. And he gave you this powder and it got rid of the pain like a shot. And I said to him, could we get a prescription for that, Doc? And he said, sure. Luther, are you all right? What do you mean, am I all right? Last night, you dreamed the house was coming apart. That was no dream. And now you have this uh, illusion that I was ill and we went to see Dr. Simmons? We did. No, my dear, we did no such thing. Well, how do you account for the prescription? What prescription? Well, this one here. Yes? Well, wait a minute, I, I know I put it in my pocket. Now, dear. Now, don't now dear me. I remember distinctly putting it in... No, no, no. I placed it right on top of the bureau so I wouldn't forget it. Now, here it is. <laughs> oh. Yes? Oh? Well, he may have given us this prescription some time ago. Uh-huh. Oh, look at the date. Today. Well. Yes? He may have put down the wrong date. After all, doctors are only human. I still say we went to see him this morning. Oh. Yes, dear. But I'll tell you what happened. The very next morning I woke up, I looked at Agnes. She had a pained expression on her face. I became alarmed. Oh, I have this terrible headache. Oh, wait a minute. I tried taking everything for it and nothing helps. Maybe I better see Dr. Simmons. But you went to see Dr. Simmons yesterday morning, remember? How can I remember something that didn't happen? And he gave us a prescription. Oh, Luther, I feel so bad. And I filled it for you at Belcher's Drugstore. Luther. And it's in the bathroom, in the medicine cabinet. I'll get it for you. Agnes, what'd you do with the prescription? What prescription, Luther? The one we got from Dr. Simmons. We didn't go to see Dr. Simmons. Well, I distinctly remember. I think we'd better go now, Luther. I feel terrible. Well, now, Aggie, this will do it for you every time. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Luther, you take this prescription and fill it. Next time she gets one of those headaches, give her some. Yes, Doc. Um, tell me... Yes? Are you sure that we weren't here yesterday? Yesterday? I don't recall. Luther. I could swear. I'd take my oath in court that... We were here this time yesterday morning, Doctor, and you gave me this exact self-same prescription. Hmm. Is that a fact? Yes. Tell me, Luther, what are you smoking these days? I let it go. You can tell by the way folks look at you that sometimes it just doesn't pay to press a point. So I took Agnes home and I filled the prescription. I didn't give old man Belcher at the pharmacy any fall draw about didn't I have this filled yesterday either. Then I thought I'd just go to the club for a while and relax. I just settled down in an easy chair when... All right, you guessed it. Ah, Professor Temple, my favorite mathematician. Oh, uh, good afternoon, Professor Tano. Stuart, some hot rum punch is wanted here. Oh, no, thanks. I, I really not Nonsense, couldn't. nonsense, my friend. You are obviously under the weather. A hot drink will certainly pick you up and clear your head. I, my head seems to be clear. Good. You shall need a clear head for what I intend to tell you. Oh? Attend to this, Professor. This coming century shall see man free from the bonds of Earth. Uh, actually, Professor, I have an appointment. Of course. At... An appointment with destiny. As we're saying, 
Man shall leave the surface of the earth. Man shall defy the enslaving forces of gravity. Man shall soar through the skies. Come now, Professor. He is doing it already. The Wright brothers have breathed the air of higher altitudes. Professor, I must tell you, I am not interested. But the future of the world is in flight. If the good Lord had intended for us to fly, he would have given us wings. But he has. He has given us a winged imagination. And therefore, we can make the wings of flight. If it's all the same to you, I'll stay here on good old terra firma. It is a company that will make flying through the air... Available to all. Please, Professor... Lighter than air machines or airplanes will soon fill the skies. They will replace the huge, ponderous railways. Well, what has this to do with me? There is a company that will develop these machines. Oh, the I see. Stock sells now for only pennies a share. I've heard that one before. An investment of $1,000 now could be worth, within three decades, almost $10 million. Seven million from the horseless carriages, and now ten million more from these flying machines. Is there no limit to the fortunes that can be made? No, Professor. None at all. I see. You really must excuse me. I'll be late for dinner. <laughs> Darling, I'm home. Oh, how was the meeting? What meeting? Aren't you becoming the absent-minded professor, the meeting of the Mathematics Society? Oh, that isn't until after supper. Oh, dear, I am really starved. Starved? What's for supper? Luther, we had supper. Well, how could we have had supper? Three hours ago. What are you saying? We had supper, and then you went off to your meeting. Well, how can you say that? We had leftover turkey and salad. I've just come from the club. Darling, look. Look at the clock. Well, it can't be 10.30. That, that means I missed the meeting. But you didn't miss the meeting. You were there. No. Professor Tomlinson just called. He said he didn't have a chance to talk to you after the meeting, and he wanted to tell you what a fine speech you made. Let me... Uh, let, let me sit down. Luther? Are you all right? Yeah, just, just let me... Just, just relax. Uh, Shall I bring you something? Pie? Coffee? No, no, no. There's something must be wrong. This is the first time you ever refused... It's all right, dear. I just want to sit down and relax. Light my pipe and... think this out. If you're thinking what I'm thinking, if he wants to do some straight thinking... Maybe he'd better not light that pipe. It all began, did it not, when he left his tobacco pouch at the club. We have every hope of piercing the haze in Act Three shortly. seem to be having some problems with time in this particular story. The future and the present appear to be getting all mixed up. But according to the deep thinkers like Einstein, this should not be a cause for concern. After all, time has a habit of getting all twisted up in itself, and that's why so many of us have trouble deciding whether we're coming or going. I suppose so. Coming or going, that's pretty much the story of the world, isn't it? And usually we not only don't know where we're going, we don't even know where we've been. At least I didn't. I was sitting there in my own parlor, smoking a quiet pipe back in the year 1907. Are you feeling better, dear? I'm feeling fine. You seem to have this, uh, this disorientation about time. Now, look here. Well, you must admit you are getting things mixed up. Why am I the one that's out of step? All right, dear. I admit. I just don't know what's happening sometimes. I, I just have no recollection of going to that meeting. And making such a fine speech and, and forgetting about having had supper. 
And then that business with the prescription. And the idea that the house was falling apart. I see where you keep score. Well, that's how I can see the way the game is going. What do you mean? And you're losing, which is why you're going to see Dr. Simmons first thing in the morning. I am not going to see Dr. Simmons. Why not? Because there's nothing wrong with me. Well, I've already made an appointment. Cancel it. I will under no circumstances, and I say this definitely, go to see Dr. Simmons. Well, Luther, I find nothing wrong with you. See, Aggie, I told you. Doctor, these, um... <laughs> well, say it. Well, hallucinations. Now, Agnes... These are hallucinations that he seems to be getting. Well, yes. Luther, are you under a strain? Of course not. You smoking too much? I just have an occasional pipe. Drinking? Maybe a hot punch at the club. Well, who can say? Do everything in moderation, and if the thing persists, come back and see me in a few weeks. At which time you still won't know what's the matter with me. Probably not. But... That's the way it goes. You were the one who insisted that I go to the doctor. Would you like something to eat? And I had to pay him two dollars to find out that he didn't know what was wrong with me. Two dollars to visit a doctor? My goodness, when did he raise his rates? Maybe I was right all along. Maybe there's absolutely nothing at all wrong with me. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? I don't know. I... I honestly don't know, Aggie. Luther, why don't you go for a walk? The air might do you some good. Or stop by at the club. Oh, no. I'm not going to the club for a while. Why not? Well, lately, I don't seem to enjoy it. But you were always so fond of the place. It's just that I keep running into this fellow there. Which fellow? His name is Tano. Tano? Louis Tano. Didn't you mention him before? In some connection... Yes. I remember. He's the one who seemed to know about my inheritance. Yes. Oh, he sounds a bit spooky to me. Yes, he certainly is. Well, I'll... I'll go for a walk, anyhow. Come, Josephine, in my flying machine. Ah, Professor Temple. Oh, uh... Hello, Professor Tunnell. I never see you at the faculty club anymore. I'm so happy we met. Here, let us sit down on this bench for a moment. Uh, Professor, I happen to be in somewhat of a rush right now. A rush? My good Professor Temple, it should be made illegal to be in a rush on a day like this. So, (laughs) how are things? Things? Just fine. I I see you have a pipe. I'm a fellow smoker myself, you know. Except, well... Lately, I find my tobacco tastes rather different. Do you? So does mine. And I'm completely at a loss to explain. Well, at any rate, do you know what's happening in the city of New York? And in large cities all over the country? No. This business of electricity. They're going to... I suppose you could say pipe it, but it might be more accurate to say conduct it through wires under the ground, and soon every building, every house will be equipped with electrical current. Electrical current? Well, what will folks do with it? What do they do at present with gas? Light with it? Cook with it? Sounds far-fetched to me. Gas is so cheap and plenty. Nevertheless, it is estimated that an investment of, say, a thousand dollars will be worth it at least... I know, I know. In 30 or 40 years, it will be worth 10, 15, 20 million dollars. Am I right? Not even the sky is the limit. All I can say is... I am satisfied to have my funds draw safe and secure two and a half percent in the banks. Good day, Professor. Uh, Luther, dear. Yes? My brother called. Oh. And he told me that... That he had been tipped off about a fantastic new stock. How did you know? Did it perhaps have to do with electricity? Luther, you overheard the conversation. How could I? I was out for a walk. Well, do you think we should? As I said before, it's your money. But you know best. No, do as you please. Oh, now you're upset. I am not upset. All right, r- relax, dear. I'll get you some pie and coffee. And you might 
Light up your pipe. I don't know. The world was moving too fast, or maybe I was moving too slow. I lit up my pipe, and I felt even worse. She was unhappy. She wanted to invest her money in stocks that might or might not rise. In that case, why should I oppose her? Why should I be the villain? Just then, there was a knock on the door. Darling, uh, this gentleman, Professor Tano, is here to see you. Thank you, Mrs. Temple. Professor, forgive this intrusion. Yes? Oh, I see you're not well. Uh, I... It's uh, it's all right. Darling, uh, is something wrong? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, forgive me, I am perhaps the cause of it. You? Uh, the unwitting cause. Professor, earlier today we were sitting in the park and we complained about the strange taste of our tobaccos. Yeah. And, uh, we couldn't account for it. And then I remembered. I had left my pouch at the club one evening. Did you by any chance also forget yours? Did... Uh... Did, did I? You did. Of course you did, Luther. Don't you remember? You went back for it. Uh, and I, too, went back for mine. Uh, may I see your pouch, Professor? Ah. <laughs> Notice. What? They look exactly alike. Both are brown. Both have the initials LT. The steward must have mixed them up. Yes, of course. He gave you mine. I can smell this very special mixture. I hope you didn't suffer any discomfort. The blend is rather strong, you know. Uh, I'm quite all right. Thank you. No, no, no. I can see you're not, if if you'll excuse me. Good night. Good night, Professor Tano. Uh, don't bother. I can let myself out. Agnes, as I said before, it's your money. Do, do as you please. No, dear. I want you to make that decision. But you have the right. The right, perhaps, the wisdom, no. You're as wise as I am, Agnes. Perhaps, but not as experienced. You see, I know nothing of the world outside. I was raised to be a man's wife. I was trained in the ways to keep him content. And years from now, perhaps, women will be taught how to make their own way, but... It will be too late for me. I, I guess. And so I'm happy. I have what I want. And it will be enough. Agnes, I'm so t tired. What sort of tobacco does that man smoke? Seems so strong. I'm s so tired. So tired. Sleep on that June day in 1907. Or was I asleep? Suddenly I was walking along the street. I had never seen such a street, or such buildings, such crowds, heard such noises. And not only were there horseless carriages, there were horseless trolley cars. And they weren't on tracks, they just ran. And overhead, I could hear a drone of mighty engines. I looked up. They were enormous flying machines. And all over, electric lamps were blinking on and off. It was the most dizzying sight. What did I tell you? Professor Tano. Well, well, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? What's here? Look at yourself. A most distinguished elderly gentleman. What happened to me? To, to you? We, we look older. Well, we should. We are no longer young bucks in our thirties. We are now in our late sixties. That's impossible. Why? Time passes. Uh, your car is at the curb. My car? That elegant limousine. That's mine. Inside you go. The airport, Morgan. I have a 
car and a chauffeur. And a private airplane. And a penthouse apartment in New York. An estate in Hollywood. A chateau near Paris. A townhouse in London. Wow. <laughs> Your fortune, my friend. You are worth millions. Perhaps billions. I don't understand. You invested in the right stocks at the right time. Yes, yes. I see I did, but... Those were the stocks you told me about. Of course. Money goes to money. It's like a snowball rolling down Mount Everest. I'm glad I listened to you. Oh, I'm glad. Your wife is waiting. Oh, marvelous. Agnes is here, too. Agnes? My wife. Oh, Agnes. She was your first wife. My... My first wife? She divorced you. Well, why? She had no choice. She caught you with that dancer. Which dancer? I would never cheat on Agnes. Oh, you remember? You started making money and you decided to invest in a Broadway show. It was a terrific hit, incidentally. What happened to Agnes? What's the difference? You've had three wives since then. And I don't know how many mistresses. What happened to Agnes? Oh, you really don't want to know what's happened to Agnes. What happened to Agnes? Tell me. What happened to her? What, what, what happened to Agnes? Uh, wake up. What happened nothing, to... Nothing, nothing happened to Agnes. I'm here. Yes. Yes, that's right. And, and here's where you'll stay. That that money also stays in the bank. Do, do you understand? I don't want us to get rich. Do you know why? I can't afford it. I could have been rich. These past 30 years, the stocks I could have bought would have turned to pure gold. Luther, are you talking to yourself again? I never talk to myself. Do you remember years ago, Agnes, back in mm, 1900? Mm, I certainly do. I remember I had this inheritance from my aunt. I listened to you and put it in the bank. If I'd listened to myself and bought those certain stocks, we'd be rich people today. Who says we're not even richer the way things turned out? I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. Agnes, let's have another cup of coffee. And let's have another piece of pie. <laughs> That's because around every corner, for Luther and Agnes, there's a rainbow in the sky. What is wealth, anyhow? As the poet put it, which would you rather have, a full purse and an empty heart, or the other way around? I realize there can be differences of opinions on this. I shall return shortly. The title of our little tale has been Pie in the Sky, and it has been written specially for all who lament what they consider their lost opportunity. How many of us sigh and say, oh, if only we had been around when? Well, suppose you had been around when land was dirt cheap, when fantastic growth stocks were still selling for pennies, when you could have bought great art from starving artists for the price of a cup of coffee. Would you have made the right moves? And if you're wondering whatever became of Professor Tonneau, he became a billionaire. And in 1927, he was shot by a jealous husband. Our cast included Terry Keene, Bob Caliban, and Bernie Grant. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown.